Professor Bernard Ferenja is a Dutch citizen, born in 1951 in the Netherlands, affiliated with the University of Groningen in the Netherlands. A quien dedicó el Premio Nobel? I dedicated my Nobel Prize to my, uh, my parents and to my students. First of all, my parents, because they were so important. Can you imagine they were farmers? They never had the opportunity to study. And they all yeah, made it possible, and they made it possible that I could go to the university and ultimately became a professor, could do research. Bienvenidas y bienvenidos, gracias por acompañarnos en esta transmisión especial llevada hasta ustedes a través de UACJ TV. Mi nombre es Gustavo Cabullo Madrid, reportero de la Dirección General de Comunicación Universitaria. Hoy nos acompaña en entrevista un premio Nobel de Química. Se trata del doctor Bernard Lucas Feringa, mejor conocido como Ben Feringa. Él es encargado de impartir este año la Cátedra Patrimonial Douglas Orcheroff 2022 en el Instituto de Ingeniería y Tecnología. El título de su ponencia será The Art of Building Small, el arte de construir en pequeño. Mr. Feringa, welcome. It's an honor to be here with you this day. It's a great honor for me too, yeah, to be here. El Dr. Feringa tiene una robusta currícula y ha sido multipremiado internacionalmente. Es un químico orgánico sintético holandés especializado en nanotecnología molecular y catálisis homogénea. Es profesor distinguido Hagwood van de Hoff de Ciencias Moleculares en el Instituto Strength de Química en la Universidad de Groningen de los Países Bajos y profesor de la Academia Real de Artes y Ciencias de los Países Bajos. En 2016 fue galardonado con el Premio Nobel de Química junto con Sir Fraser Studart y Jean-Pierre Sauvage por el diseño y síntesis de máquinas moleculares. Doctor Feringa, welcome again. It's my great pleasure. Tenemos entendido que usted arribó a Ciudad Juárez ayer. Yes, I arrived yesterday. Yes. ¿Qué sí. impresión le ha dejado la frontera? Oh, it's it's great to be here. You know, I've never been in this part of, uh, of Mexico or the United States. Uh, so we crossed El Paso and we crossed the border, came in here, and to see this part of Mexico, yeah, with a long history, of course. Yeah, I like history a lot, and. Uh, I, I, I enjoy it very much. Have you heard of Ciudad Juárez? Of course, it was a border town, and it is a very important uh, uh, place in the history, you know, of the North Americas, and especially, of course, in Mexico. And, uh, and of course, in Europe also, we get uh, in the newspapers, you know, these messages about, yeah, uh, gangs and so, you know, uh, uh, violence. But uh, honestly, I know they have also an important university and so, and uh, so I, I was really happy to go here, you know, to visit. Mr. Feringa, ya tuvo el gusto de probar nuestra gastronomía? Yeah, no, I, we had some, uh, we had, I had breakfast here, of course, and so, and we will have a meal a little bit later. But what is maybe more important, uh, my friends here took me to the Kentucky bar, Margarita. where I had the tequila, oh. which is really nice, you know, <laughs> eh? very special. <laughs> I cannot get this in Holland. Ciudad Juárez, déjame le digo, es una tierra de paso para miles de personas que desean emigrar a Estados Unidos, que buscan un mejor futuro. ¿Por qué considera usted que la gente emigra? I don't have so so much uh, comments on immigration policy because it's also in Europe an important issue, of course, uh, immigrants from North Africa, from the Middle East, you know, Syria, and so we know. Um, but what is really important, in my opinion, and of course I'm a professor at the university to train your young people well and to develop yeah, your area, your region, your city, etc. And the universities play a crucial role there. Centers of education, that is the future yeah, for our young people, the future for the next generation. Yes? And then you will develop yeah, very strongly yeah, in your own region, in your own country, and people don't have to emigrate yeah, to find a better future, because that's usually a reason eh, to emigrate, to find a better, re or for safety reasons, yeah? But education is where it all starts, the basis for the future of the next generation. Usted creció con nueve hermanos. ¿Cómo fue su niñez? Yes, I was, I grew up on a farm in a very small village, 
uh, close to the German border in the northeastern part of Holland. I'm from a Roman Catholic family. I'm the second oldest of 10 children. And uh, of course, we had to attend church every weekend, which we still, we, but most important is I think we had a very tight family, yeah? And we, we, I was with my brother, we were the first to go to higher education because nobody in our village ever went to a university or a higher technical college. So my brother, my eldest brother, he became an engineer, mechanical engineer. I studied chemistry and my younger sisters and so many of them studied also, uh, you know. And my parents could never study, they worked on the farm, you know. So I, this is the situation I came from. But living on the farm, yeah, has the opportunity as a child to discover. And that was wonderful. I think that is where it all started. Por qué es importante que un país esté educado? Now you have to realize every child has a talent. Some children are really good with their hands. They become carpenters, artists, car mechanics. Others are really talented and do mathematics or languages or whatever. I think every child should get the opportunity to get educated and to get to the level, you know, they can reach, yeah? Not everybody goes to the university, but realize you should stimulate young children, yeah? elementary school, high school, higher education, to get the best out of them, yes? I think that is really important. And that will help them for their future because it bites, it's the basis for the future. Why is it important that the governments invest in science and technology? You have to realize that science and technology is the basis for our modern society, yeah? Without science and technology, you would not have a smartphone. Yeah? You would not have this camera. You would not have modern pharmaceuticals for your health. You would not have a car or an airplane. And I think we have all facing a modern society, which we appreciate a lot. But now look to the future. Climate change, yeah? We have to make things different, sustainable, green, yeah? Less energy. How are we going to do that in the future? And a lot of it, yeah, of course, it is also the behavior of people, yeah, social sciences and so on, but a lot will come from new technologies. Eh? How are we going to fly our planes in the future without kerosene? How are we going to drive electric cars if we, we have to develop the batteries for the electric cars to make better pharmaceuticals to treat the elder people? Yeah, cancer, which is still a big problem, heart disease. So I, I think science and technology is, is, will be a really crucial for making a sustainable society of the future. We will have now 8 billion people in this world. Soon there will be 10 billion. We have to learn how to recycle our materials, how to reuse them again, how to recycle plastics, all these things that we use. Otherwise, we have a serious problem in the future. We already have a problem. So we need a lot of new technology. ¿Qué lo motivó en su vida para interesarse en la investigación en la química? This is really interesting, you know. When I went to high school, gymnasium, I got physics, mathematics, biology, chemistry, yeah. And uh, my best marks were in mathematics, yeah. But I liked experiments. And chemistry, the chemistry teacher in high school did experiments with us. And I liked that a lot, making colors, making smells, making all kinds of nice things, materials, etc. This was the basis for going to the university. Yes, I think all of us remember one good teacher that makes the difference and makes you going in a certain direction. Recuerda cuál fue su primer experimento? Uh, I remember experiments at, at, at school, of course, but the first experiment I will tell tomorrow at the university <laughs> <laughs> when I did my, made my first chemical compound, yeah, that nobody else had made in the world. It was useless, but it was, for me, so important. Eh? Nobody else had made that molecule. That was really important. It's like making a discovery eh, for the first time. Eh? You feel very excited. How is a normal day in your life? Now, 
I, uh, of course, things have changed after this magic call from Stockholm, yeah, where I got the Nobel Prize. I get many, many requests, you know, to give lectures, to be in committees, scientific committees, etc., well, all over the world. So I have many, many, many duties. But still, the basis is that I give, I teach to students, so I give lectures to students, and I have a research group, so I continue doing research. And there is a third component that when the journalist asked me in Stockholm, what are you going to do? I said, look, I'm a scientist. I want to continue with science because there are many things to discover. I want to teach. I like teaching also. But I also want to go to the public to tell about the beauty of science and particularly chemistry. And I also started a foundation, the Feringa Foundation, Het Veringa Fonds dat is bedoeld om de wetenschap voor het voetlicht te brengen bij het grote publiek, bij scholieren en ook om onderzoek te stimuleren. And we go to give public events and we go to schools, elementary schools and high school every month with some students together. We go there, we have discussions with the kids, with the students, we do experiments with the students. This is what we also do. ¿Qué ve usted en los jóvenes? ¿Hay interés por la ciencia de parte de la gente joven? Yes, the, uh, there is certainly an interest for science, and especially when you start at young age. When you go to elementary schools, it's amazing when you do experiments. We do experiments, eh? Five, six, seven year old kids, yeah? Up to 12 or so, eh? Elementary school. It's absolutely amazing. They like experiments. They like to discover. We see a lot of interest, you know? And of course, it might change a little bit when they are teenagers and so, yeah? but we still see a lot of interest in science. And when you have good teachers, yeah, that make them enthusiastic. But it's very important, children like to learn by discovering. And I feel that they are very much interested. Many, not everybody, but a lot of children like science. ¿Qué impacto en la vida de las personas han tenido sus investigaciones? Oh, uh, the, we do very fundamental research, yes? So this motion that I'm going to talk about tomorrow. But I will also show examples where we work now with the medical people, surgeons in the hospital, on new ways to do cancer treatment, yeah? Making smart pharmaceuticals. We also work with companies on making, for instance, sustainable paint and coating yeah, for your car, for the industry. Yeah? So this is something that has uh, already impact in the near future. The basic research on molecular motion, molecular machines might take another 20, 30 years, yes? Professor Bernard Feringa is a Dutch citizen, born in 1951 in the Netherlands, affiliated with the University of Groningen in the Netherlands. ¿Cómo recibió usted la noticia de que sería el Premio Nobel 2016? Yeah, when I got this magic call from Stockholm, they call you one hour before the official announcements, yeah? And I was discussing with my students about some chemical problem in my office, and then I got this telephone call. And of course, I, I could not speak for five minutes because it was such a big surprise, yeah? And so uh, it is it's, it's absolutely... Uh, amazing you know it comes as a big surprise because of, nobody tells you of course eh? you you don't know that you are nominated or so and it came uh, as uh, yeah it was absolutely wonderful and uh, after a few minutes the secretary of the Nobel committee said to me professor Fieringa are you still on the phone because it's so quiet yes yes I'm I may still here but I'm speechless <laughs> By the late 1990s, Ben Feringer and his group made a significant breakthrough when they demonstrated a molecular rotary motor. Tuve la oportunidad de ver la ceremonia via YouTube por internet. ¿Qué corría por su mente cuando usted estaba en la ceremonia? Yeah, this is like you feel like being in a movie, you know. It feels like a, a bit. It's very, very. It's absolutely amazing. Yeah. 
There are 1,200 people there. Yeah? The king is there, the queen, and all the dignitaries, the government, etc. And uh, you are dressed up, you know, and you get this, this gold medal. And so it's, it's really absolutely uh, fantastic. You are speechless. A quien dedicó el premio Nobel? I dedicated my Nobel Prize to my, uh, my parents and to my students. First of all, my parents, because they were so important. Can you imagine? They were farmers. They never had the opportunity to study. And they all yeah, made it possible. And they made it possible that I could go to university and ultimately became a professor, could do the research. And my students, of course, because you should realize in chemistry, in natural sciences, in engineering, we all work with students. We do research, but the main goal is to train our students beyond our current frontiers, to train our students for the, stu for the future. So they are, they are my real heroes. We all do, do all this research, of course, together with our students, to train them, to do discoveries, etc. We work as a team, eh? that's really important. ¿Considera que la familia está detrás de todo el esfuerzo científico reconocido? Yeah, no, I, I think uh, my family was very supportive, although my parents never went to higher education. Uh, but they were very supportive that we, we study, that we learn, yeah? build a good basis for our future, whatever we would be. Eh? So several of my, my sisters, for instance, they are teachers yeah? at schools. Others, are, one is uh, they are in healthcare or in psychology. But it's important that you get this encouragement by your parents. Second, your teachers. Because realize not every family has the possibility to encourage their kids enough. So the teachers have a very important role here. Para la gente que no está muy especializada en el tema, ¿cuál es la trascendencia de la nanotecnología? Nanotechnology, of course, is the, we all know microtechnology, eh? the microtechnology that led to the chips and eh, in the computer science and all these things. Nanotechnology is the next step. And you see now already that the latest generation computer chips are 10 nanometer or so in size. So this is already real nanotechnology. And the trend is to go to the smaller size, yeah, more complicated yeah, structures, etc. That will help us to build better, better medicine, yeah, new materials, maybe better energy storage, batteries, etc., catalyst for sustainable chemical conversions and making materials. And so all these kind of smart materials of the future that we will get, I think nanotechnology will play a crucial role because you are able to structure and make function at the nanoscale, one billion of a meter in size. Yeah? This is the future. Usted recibió el Premio Nobel por las máquinas a escala molecular. ¿Cuál sería la aplicación futura de estas máquinas? The next step, there are many next steps, but what we do now, for instance, is we make uh, coatings for surfaces yeah, that uh, uh, are responsive, eh, because they move under the influence of light. Light comes to a surface, and then it can, yeah, because of the molecular machine. So you can have surfaces that clean themselves. Think about windows that can clean themselves, or your car can clean themselves, or materials that repair themselves in the future. Yeah? So you have a scratch in your car, don't worry, over 20 years it will repair itself. ¿Cuál cree que sean los nuevos retos de la química con respecto al desarrollo de conocimiento ante una contingencia como el COVID-19? Oh, the chemistry played a crucial role because realize we all got vaccinations, vaccines. But the basis for these vaccines was the nanotechnology of the mRNA, yeah? Nucleotides in the 80s, 40 years ago. Changing, yeah, modifying the nucleotides. That made it possible that within a year we could make vaccines. Yeah? Very fundamental science that 40 years later made it possible that we could make vaccines within half a year or one year. Second, I think, a knot of technology, chemistry, that was done to make all the components to make, bring it, in, the vaccine, into your body, eh? Because it's not only what you get injected, 
is not only the vaccine, eh? the antibody, but it's also all kinds of other components like detergents, you know, to get it into the cell. You have to get it in the cell. So there was a lot of development, chemical development, yeah, molecular design to make this all possible. Both the vaccine, but also all the, the ways to get it in your body. Eh? Otherwise, we would not get vaccination. ¿Qué opinión le merece la mujer en la, en la ciencia? Uh, I think it is uh, it's really important that we stimul stimulate gender balance, of course. And in the natural sciences, traditionally, yeah, physics, chemistry, yeah, mathematics, there were less women. When I started studying, there were less women than men. Now it's changing. But of course, for me, there is no difference. Of course, it, we should stimulate everybody, you know, to go and to follow their talent and especially also in natural sciences and so that we get more women there. Yeah, this is really important. You see already there are lots of women now in biology, yeah, also in the medical school, you see a lot of women and we hope to get more women in chemistry and physics and material science and engineering and so in the future. Yeah, it's really important. ¿Qué opinión le merece las redes sociales, sobre todo en la formación académica y personal de los estudiantes? I think it is a privilege to be in the academic community because there the students can meet students of different disciplines. They can meet the professors, yeah, the training. They get exposure to the international community, different disciplines. The way of learning at the university is much more than only learning from a book or going to follow a lecture of a professor. Eh? It's also about building your community for the rest of your life and to get all this experience, yeah? Training and experience and exposure. Because you don't know exactly what your job will be later, but in the university community as a student, yeah? You make friends for the rest of your life, eh? And you get exposure. You can learn a lot. Take advantage of that. Take advantage of the fact that at the university you have this community of scholars and you can learn a lot. Also what you think may be not important now, but maybe in 10 years you are in a job and you suddenly realize how important it was for your future. Broaden your horizon at the university. Yeah, it's really important and you have the opportunity. ¿Qué mensaje le darían nuestros estudiantes universitarios? Follow your dreams. Amigos, hemos llegado a la recta final de esta entrevista. Agradecemos al doctor Bernard Lucas Feringa, premio Nobel de Química por el diseño y síntesis de máquinas moleculares. ¿Qué legado le gustaría dejar para las próximas generaciones? My legacy is my, my the young students that, that I brought towards the next step in their life, their career. And I hope They remember the opportunities they got at the university yeah, to broaden their horizon, to get educated and to get to the future and enable them indeed yeah, to follow their own dreams. Dr. Fringa, thank you for your time. Thank my, you for this opportunity to have an interview with you. My pleasure. Thank you.